Hi guys, welcome back to another tutorial on Apache Cassandra. In the last video, we looked at Cassandra's write path. In this video, we're going to look at Cassandra's read path. As we learned in the previous video, our data may be stored in a number of locations. It could be in a mem table, it could be in our commit log, it could be in any number of SS tables. So we don't have to consider any data stored in the commit log, as this is not readable and it's only there for when the node fails and we have to recreate data we may have lost. So here we can see all the places where our data could be stored. So when we receive a request to read data in Cassandra, we have to search all of these locations. So say we get a request on our partition key, and as before, our partition key is USA, and we want to get all customers that are part of the USA partition key. So first we'll look in our mem table, we'll pull out the customers that are in the mem table, we might have USA customer three, and we'll also pull out a timestamp, which we use to resolve conflicts between data that may be stored on a mem table and one of the SS tables or between SS tables, as we'll see in a second. So the timestamp on this, we'll just use an arbitrary number, might be 100. And the mem table also has USA customer 10 and their timestamp is 110. Next, we'll go and search through the SS tables and get all the data from the first SS table first. So it will again be on the partition key USA. We might have customer seven and their timestamp might be 94. We'll also have USA customer 10 and their timestamp might be 63. And we can see here that we have two USA number 10, one return from the SS table and one return from the mem table. Because the mem table's timestamp is newer, that's what will be returned to the client. We will not return this value from the SS table. We will do the same for the second SS table. We'll return all values that match our query. USA 8, and then the timestamp might be 83, and it might be USA 3, and the timestamp might be 94. And again, there's a conflict between this first value here from the mem table and this value here from the SS table, which is value 94. So again, this will not be returned to the client, only the most recent and up-to-date value will be. As we can see in both cases, the mem table was more up-to-date than the SS table. This will always be the case as the mem table will store the most recent record of the data as it has not yet been written to disk as an SS table, only to the commit log. It's possible that the mem table might hold two values for the same record. In that case, only the record with the latest timestamp will be returned. So we've looked at how Cassandra reconciles data stored in mem tables and SS tables in order to get the most recent representation of the data to our client. So how does Cassandra get this data out of the SS tables which are stored on disk in a quick and efficient manner? So in order to do this, Cassandra has a number of different caches and indexes it uses to make sure the query is performed as quickly and performant as possible. So Cassandra stores data in our SS table in an ordered manner. So say we had a table where we have a partition key and then we cluster our data based on the region the record is from. So we can see here that we might cluster on Japan, EU, China, USA, Brazil, and Australia. So Cassandra will keep all these records together ordered and it has a byte index. So we can see here at zero that Japan begins at zero bytes, EU begins at a thousand bytes, China begins at 2000, USA begins at 2400, Brazil 2600 and so on. So when we read data, we don't wanna to have to seek through the data from zero to where we wanna go. We wanna know that if our query is data from China, we can simply start at 2000 and return those. So in order to achieve this, Cassandra goes through a number of steps. The first is called a Bloom filter. And the Bloom filter can tell us two things. It can tell us that the data we're looking for is 100% not in this SS table, in which case we can move on to a different SS table because we're absolutely positive it is not here. Or it also could tell us the data might be in this SS table with a particularly high level of confidence. It's not 100% sure, so we might end up scanning an SS table and returning nothing, but it's a high probability. So the Bloom filter is our first line of defense where we can quickly say, we definitely don't have the data here, or we might have the data here, we probably do, let's have a look. 
So the second thing it hits is a key cache. And this key cache stores the byte location where our data begins. And it only stores those locations for frequently accessed data. So say we're frequently accessing data from China quite regularly. The key cache might contain China and then a byte value of 2000, which allows us to quickly go exactly where that started without having to go through the rest of the steps in the read path. This is performant as it only holds the very frequently accessed data indexes. If we held them all, it would be no different from the other steps. So if something is frequently accessed, it can be accessed with the key cache lightning quick. We then have the partition summary and the partition index, and these are quite similar. It's probably easier to explain the partition index first, which is the fourth step. What the partition index maintains is basically a full set of where all parts of our data begin. So we'll have Japan, EU, China, USA, Brazil, and Australia, and we'll have the values for all of them and the bytes where we should begin to read the data if we get a request for that type of data. So we'll have the value for each one here and Japan. So if we get a request in the partition index for China, we can quickly look it up here and see 2000, jump down there and begin reading. And this stops us having to sequentially search through our entire SS table. The partition summary helps when the partition index grows to be quite big. So say we have a huge amount of countries in our, or regions in our table, and it's actually quite an expensive process to even go through all the indexes. The partition summary basically groups the indexes together so we can begin in the right region. So say we might group like this, Japan, Europe, and China in one group, and USA, Brazil, and Australia in the other. The partition summary will quickly tell us where we should begin on the partition index. So the partition summary is kind of like a partition index for the partition index, while the partition index is just the partition index for the SS table. So it's a very similar concept. Finally, we'll have the SS table itself, and we should never have to scan the entire SS table. We should always hit something in the partition index, which will allow us to jump to exactly where we need to start reading from. If we have to read the entire SS table, it could be a very slow read operation. There are a number of other caches in Cassandra. The row cache, which we haven't discussed here, caches entire rows and can really speed up read access for frequently accessed rows. Obviously, this costs more memory usage, but can give a boost if we're frequently accessing certain rows in our data. There's also a counter cache, which is used with counters. Row cache is disabled by default, while key and counter caching is enabled by default. I believe row caching is disabled because it can be very memory intensive if not implemented correctly. Cassandra also saves caches to disk regularly. So if the node goes down, the caches can easily be rebuilt. So I hope you enjoyed this video on the Cassandra read path. If you have any questions on the read path, please don't be afraid to leave them in the comments section. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel and give the video a thumbs up. In the next video, we'll talk about the process of compaction, which is used to minimize the number of SS tables we have to go through in order to satisfy a request for data from a client.